Meet Chuck Reese, a writer and editor-in-chief of Salvation South, a website where Southerners can share their stories in the forms of journalism and fiction. After years of working in journalism and politics, Chuck has dedicated himself to using the power of storytelling to bring about change in the South, and maybe even America as a whole. Welcome to Scratch Claw Push, a podcast about artists clawing out a place for themselves in the world. I'm Billy Joe Combs. And I'm Brandon Duke. Let's go. So welcome to the show, Mr. Chuck Reese. I am so glad to be here. Always glad to be with you, Brandon. And Billy Joe, it's nice to meet you too. So, yeah, what well, at the top, yeah, like I've been following Chuck for a very long time, and I think we only just got to meet in person, what, maybe less than a year ago? Yeah, I think it was last, last, maybe in the fall, I think, yeah. Yeah, I want to say, yeah, because it, it, was, it was funny because I was just thinking about that today. It was actually at a uh, an event for an author. Oh, okay. Yeah, Charles, was it Charles McNair? At, uh, yeah, that's who it was. That's who it was. Charles McNair, who has written for me at, at both of the publications that I've, I've founded, who is a really, really interesting guy. And, uh, you know, I, I would say one of our most twisted <laughs> Southern authors, <laughs> you know, Charles is Charles is just brilliant. I mean, and like his most recent book, uh, which we were there celebrating last fall, is called The Epicureans. And uh, the Epicureans uh, are a group of people who like to eat human flesh. So, <laughs> yeah, it's a great book. Charles yeah. is a great writer. And I it's so funny it. because go ahead. No, no, no. I just said now I remember at the event there was someone who's like, Are we sitting here celebrating an author in 2022? And somebody was in the back, like, Hell yeah, we are. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's worthy of celebration. Charles is 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 a good hearted guy and a wonderful writer. Yeah. So um, at the top of the show, uh, we usually like to uh, start things off with a, a little thing we call the 60-second intro. So what we're going to do is we're going to give you 60 seconds, and you tell us kind of, this is like your elevator pitch of yourself, or your oh, verbal uh, resume. My, el- my, my, my virtual resume, okay, in yes, 60 like we're seconds getting, we're getting or like less. The one pager, not the full CV, just like, you know, you're trying to go like up to 60 seconds, but not over it. Think of it like Got blackjack. It. All right, and so you're going to cut me off at 60? Uh, we'll you. let you. I mean, if it's like a few seconds over, but I mean, like we we, we, we started this because Bill... <laughs> you can, you <laughs> can grab the hook if Billy... you want to. I don't care. No, because what was it? Was it Billy? You said you went to some seminar where someone, they got asked that question and they literally talked for like 30 minutes straight. It was it was a voiceover workout. And, you know, in theory, it, it's only, you only have, you have like 10 people who all want to participate the the guest person is supposed to facilitate that and they're supposed to be letting everybody read right but when they take up a half an hour of the hour and a half with just their resume <laughs> there's not much time left to do many auditions you know uh you know reads or whatever so right. it, it was it was a little frustrating and so after after that i was like okay if i i could have read all of that on your website or online somewhere like I didn't, I didn't need every, a detail of every company you've ever worked at and who you worked with at the company. <laughs> Cause that's kind of what we got. So, right. Yeah. Okay, and also so it doesn't it's... leave anywhere for the interviews to go, you know, like there's no intrigue anymore. <laughs> no mystery. I'm so. all about the creation of intrigue. So there I'm with go. you. All right. All right. So, um, uh, all right, Billy, uh, I'll let you, uh, let you run it. Okay. And go. My name is Chuck Reese, and I've kind of made a career out of editing, creating and editing publications that try to make sense of the American South, uh, which is a difficult thing to do and is particularly a difficult thing to do uh, among all the people who aren't from here or don't have roots here or have no connections here. Uh, We're a region that a lot of people look uh, 
askance at. Uh, but uh, those people typically are making assumptions that all of us are, are a certain way when we are not. So what we try to do, and this is particularly true with Salvation South, the, the, the publication I'm running currently, uh, we, we invite Southern storytellers of all kinds, whether they are writers of journalism or fiction or memoir or essays or poems, Keep going. To tell their own <laughs> Southern stories in the way they choose. Just nice. over. Perfect. That was really, that was really good. Um, it's really curious. Like, I love hearing about this because um, I am not from the South, despite okay. having the name Billy Joe and ba being asked my whole life if I'm from the South. <laughs> I'm not. And, and I just moved down here in 2019. So, you know, my... Mm -hmm vision of the South, you know, I, I think comes from literature and comes from, um, you know, the things that I've read like that. So, mm -hmm. so yeah. So if you were going to tell I mean, I guess, well, why did you start, you started B Bitter Southerner? Is that correct? That's right. In 2013. Okay. And why did you start that? And then transitioning, why did you leave that and go to the new one? Uh, the original impetus for starting The Bitter Southerner was simply that uh, I felt like the South was a region that the national media stereotyped all the time. Uh, we were frequently victims. The region was frequently a victim of, of what I, I and many other people refer to as parachute journalism, you know, where uh, the reporter from... New York or Los Angeles or Chicago would uh, arrive somewhere in the South for two or three days and try to deliver a piece that would interpret what was actually going on down here. Uh, and so I wanted a publication whose primary purpose was to debunk uh, stereotypes about the South. And I think the Bitter Southerner did a very good job of that. Um, but by the time we got to 2020, uh, which was when I parted ways with the Bitter Southerner, uh, I had begun to feel like uh, stereotypes were the least of our region's problems. Uh, I had begun to feel like uh, division among people of different groups and, and the viciousness of it. Uh, were far bigger problem than debunking stereotypes. And, you know, uh, my partners and I at the Bitter Southerner disagreed about how to move down that path. So uh, I took a year off and, and came back with Salvation South 14 months after I'd left the Bitter Southerner. And, uh, you know, our purpose here is, you know, we, we talk about wanting to do stories that offer rays of hope about this region, uh, but that doesn't mean we are at all Pollyanna-ish in what we do. Uh, we, uh, I, I guess the way I would put it is, is that We try to make a home, and I, you know, it's funny. I, I say we try to make a home. I, I, a word that's been popping into my head a lot lately is is that Salvation South has become kind of a refuge for Southern storytellers who want to do a couple of basic things. They want to tell stories that demonstrate their willingness and or the willingness of other Southerners to reckon with the past of this place because the history of this region is ridiculously dark. I mean, we are the home of America's original sin, right? Uh, and the, you know, the other thing that they want to do, though, is to celebrate the culture of the South. And and the thing that, that I always, you know, like to think about when I'm thinking about the culture of the South is that, even though the South became known 
for its own choices, you know, a century, a half ago and beyond, uh, you know, for racial enmity and violence and oppression. The culture of the South has come from a, a polyglot, the polyglot nature of our culture. That includes people who came here by choice, colonists, people who came here not by choice, enslaved people. And, you know, between these different, you know, European cultures that, that came here uh, with the colonists, the, the colonists and the West African and Caribbean cultures that came here uh, and, and the native cultures that were here before either of those two groups arrived. Uh, we got a culture that is a lot like a gumbo, you know, and it's funny when you think about that metaphor, because gumbo is literally, you know, I mean, not only is it one of the dishes for which Southern cuisine is known all over, but it's a dish that actually incorporates from the very beginning of it back in the 1700s, the, the European culinary influences, the African culinary influences, and the Caribbean culinary influences. And it's, it's a delicious thing. And I just kind of think of, you know, and the magic is that it all comes together thanks to one ingredient, which is okra. Okra is it has that delightful mucilaginous goo that, that sort of brings the whole gumbo pot together. And uh, okra is like the South's greatest undeserved gift because okra is not native to North America. Okra came here in the form of seeds in the pockets of people who had been enslaved and were being brought here to work on plantations. You know, so we, we took this thing that we have no right to have in the first place, uh, or at least the white people had no right to have in the first place. And, uh, you know, something beautiful came out of it. And that's true in the musical culture and the literary culture. And it's, it, it, when you look at Southern culture in, in general, it's the product of people of different kinds coming together to do something cool. I think in that, that you could even like extend that like even further not not just into well, i mean i know that's that's kind of like the uh the catch-all metaphor but i mean you also think about like a lot of american music you know that came out of the south like primarily starting like you know it was like you know blues or rhythm and blues whichever term you want to use and then jazz you know coming like you know again like stuff that was yeah you know, like african rhythms mixed with like some european you know structures here and there and then like you know you have these new form of music and like you were saying like i was like undeserved gifts because uh you and i actually spoke on a previous podcast and we'll try not to get too political here but we talk about like you know one of the things that like Amer america's gotten so successful for is its culture and you look a lot of its culture is coming through music oh yeah of course, absolutely and you know the, the southern music you know the, there's okay first of all uh, Everyone knows, including music nerds who aren't from here at all. Everyone agrees that American music is Southern music, right? Because all of the, the forms of music that we know is uniquely American began down here. Uh, and, you know, the thing about it is, is, is that the... American, you know, we think about, okay, the Mississippi Delta is where the blues came from, and New Orleans is where jazz came from. Well, both of those things are true, but they are not entirely true, right? If you want to look for the roots of American music, and actually, I've been working for months on a story about this that we're going to publish early next year, it looks like. It's a lot of work. Uh but uh, if you follow the path 
that enslaved people followed as they moved throughout the region, right? Both during the period of slavery and after. New forms of music spring up wherever their native rhythms and songs and storytelling butts up against other influences, right? You know, that when enslaved Africans are are uh, you know working on plantations in servitude uh, the blues music emerges as a way to vent the frustration of that uh, their need to celebrate uh, spiritually and religiously turns into you know the black gospel which in turn influences the blues and vice versa and then all of those things to you know, clashed up against European and orchestral instrumentation and, and gave us jazz, you know. And, and so there are, you know, pockets all over the South where there are little miracles, musical miracles that happened along the way. And over, you know, the, the decades and the centuries, we get this amazing musical heritage. So with all this in mind, let's – so – you know, get, so like you, you coming in at you, you're starting off as a journalist, you know, um, how is that like, how is all this like, you know, I know how is all this like affected, like your own writing, you know, going in a, I, cause I know like you, you started for people who don't know, you started your career in New York. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah, I did. Uh, love New York city. I've lived up there twice. It's, it was, it was a wonderful place to be. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I would say my obsession, which really is a fair way to put it, with, with sort of co-opting Southern stereotypes is, uh, has a lot to do with my experience when I first moved up there. I moved up there. I, I got hired by Adweek magazine, which covers the advertising industry right out of college. And I spent a year in their Atlanta bureau, and then the folks on the national desk in New York called me up and asked me if I wanted to move to New York. And I'd spent a summer uh, in an internship there a couple of years before, and I decided, yeah, I'd I'd love to move back. So uh, uh, I went back, and you know, it it really hit me a lot harder after I was living up there as opposed to just being an intern, right? Sort of knowing everything is temporary. That, you know, there were things about me that were never going to fit, right? And when I was working in a regular newsroom day in and day out, people made fun of me. They made fun of the way I talked, you know, and they respected me. They knew I could write. They knew I was smart, but you know, they, they, you know, they, they would give me the business all the time. And, you know, I really wanted to debunk those stereotypes. And, you know, like I figured out pretty quickly that the accent I had, you know, this Appalachian twang I got that I grew up with, I was never going to get rid of it. You know, I, I finally, I think got to the, to the point where I could, you know, order a bagel and a cup of coffee in a deli without being, you know, called out for my accent. But, you know, I, 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 I you know, I, 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 so I just, after a while, I just kind of owned it. Right. You know, like once you see that I can make a compound complex sentence on the fly, you know, <laughs> then maybe you'll, you'll start to believe differently about me. You know, and and like when I was, you know, first trying to combat the the stereotypes that that people had of me, you know, I would uh, in the beginning, it was just pranks. And then later it became writing about it. But like I remember this, you know, that I I, I moved up there in the fall and, uh, uh, you know, 
one of the things that the folks in the newsroom like to ask me was if my family was moonshiners, right? Because they had learned I was from the Appalachian Mountains. And uh, and I was like, uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> but, you know, uh, but anyway, what I did was, you know, where I come from, which is Ella J, Georgia, which many people in Georgia will know is the apple capital of Georgia. It is a place where more apples are raised than any other place in the state. And the folks who lived in the mountains around Ella J didn't make corn whiskey or moonshine. They made apple brandy. It's still clear, very potent liquor, but the mash is made out of apples instead of corn. And so I came home for Christmas that first year I was in New York and uh, a family member who I still will not name uh, scored me a pint <laughs> of homemade apple brandy. And I, you know, you could fly with liquids in your carry on bag back then. And I took this pint jar of liquor back to New York and, and, you know, we put, this was a weekly magazine. We put it to bed every Friday night. And I, you know, as we were closing, uh, the weekly issue on the Friday after Christmas, I, I took this thing out of my, my book bag and I grabbed a bunch of those little conical paper cups out of the water cooler and gathered up all my editors and I poured them a shot of this stuff. You know, and and if you've never had mountain apple brandy, it smells like an orchard and tastes so beautiful until it gets about right here. And then it's like, you know, it's like an explosion going it's off like in the, her gut. It's like the scene in Alien. Yeah, it's, it it's ridiculous. Yeah, it burns, burns, burns. Uh, but... Uh, <laughs> It was funny the next, you know, they all walked off and they were pretty impressed, you know, and uh, the next Monday morning when, when I came into work, my editor in chief was in there and he was, he was a Boston blue blood born and raised, you know, literally grew up on Beacon Hill in Boston. And uh, I walked into the newsroom fairly early that month, that Monday and he said, Mr. Reese, come over here. And I walked over to his desk and he was like, I don't know what was in that shit you gave me on Friday night. <laughs> but at 1130, I found myself in a rental car in the Bronx and I had no idea how I got there. <laughs> so he, he better be glad that you didn't give him some real moonshine because yeah I, god yeah. knows where he god only well, knows where he'd ended up now th that stuff is real moonshine it just tastes different okay i mean i, was say, I don't know like i don't know what they're what the what the brandy's like but i've i've heard the, stories the, the alcohol content is okay. is really high <laughs> like if you know anything about bourbon making you know the stuff that comes out of the still is is clear right it mm -hmm. gets its color from being aged in a barrel right mm -hmm. and when it comes out of the still it's at its the, the biggest strength it will ever be at and they refer to that clear stuff as the white dog and uh you know so when your corn liquor comes out or your apple brandy comes out or whatever it's like just stupid strong you know because all those mountain folks were trying to get as much yield out of every, you know, mash they could get. So they kept distilling it and distilling it and distilling it until they got every last drop of goodness out of it. Out of it. And the, the longer they distilled it, the higher the alcohol content got. So, so Chuck, you were, how long were you in New York? And I'm, I'm curious when you were, when you were there. I was were, there. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I was yeah. going to say when you were there, because it sounds like now you're mostly creating your own stuff. And I'm curious kind of what point that happened. Were were you creating for yourself while you were working at Adweek or did that kind of come later? Well, I was doing some freelance writing because I, I thought I wanted to be a music critic. And then mm -hmm. I discovered that freelancing record reviews was a really good way to starve. And, uh, 
so, you know, I, I didn't really start creating for myself, like, you know, creating a space for the sort of writing that I create space that I've created spaces for, you know, over the last 10 years, 11 years. Uh, but I, uh, you know, my career was a checkered past. I was a journalist. You know, I stayed with Adweek for, I think, about five years total. And uh, then was at another magazine in New York and then got offered a job by a magazine back in Atlanta uh, and came home after I'd been living up there for five years, almost exactly. Uh, spent two years continuing in journalism in Atlanta, and then I got sucked into podcasts, or not podcasts, mm -hmm. duh. I got sucked into politics, that other P word. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was, I had covered the uh, a governor's race in Georgia, and um, the fellow who won the governor's race I covered about five months after he was inaugurated, out of the blue, asked me to come be his press secretary. And I'd been writing uh, about business mostly for, you know, eight years. Uh, I was getting kind of tired of it. So I was looking for something different to do. And uh, I'm sorry. Hold on a minute. <laughs> I should have turned that off. Uh, but anyway, uh, you know, I was looking for something else to do. You know, I wanted to move into another kind of journalism. Uh, but I got this job offer and I was like, well, it'll be interesting. It'll be an adventure. So <laughs> I did politics for five years and then sort of got sucked into corporate communications. And I just sort of followed, you know, the money uh, until I was, you know, 25 years deep into my career. And when I started The Bitter Southerner, that was when I returned to journalism. You know, and uh, and and started creating things, you know, for myself. So I, I, I do have this sort of twisted path to getting where I've wound up. So what was the the moment, or I guess the I guess the thing that kind of lit that fire, where you you kind of said like, okay, I need to go. You know, it's like because it, it's been a thing here. We've had people that like you know they get lost in like corporate America. You know, yeah. you know, like we all got to eat, we all got to pay our, yeah, we all got to eat, we all got to pay our bills. But yeah. like, what was that thing that finally dr made you take that leap to starting the bitter Southerner back in the day? Well, I was, uh, I, I would say it was probably just the fact that I saw it was possible, right? Uh, it, it, the early teens was a really interesting time in communication on the web. Because if you remember back before that, you know, in the earlier days of the Internet, it used to be that if you had an organization that needed a website, you would design, uh, you know, a site for the computer, right? And then phones that could do web pages came along and you had to design a separate site. You know, it was usually like m.whatever.com. And, you know, those were two completely different technological things. But then uh, responsive design came along where you could do a website with, you know, you could do one website that would just adjust itself differently depending on what kind of device it was being rendered on. And, you know, as soon as that came about, there you know, some of the big organ news organizations, the New York Times in particular, started doing some really interesting things, you know, with with the flexibility they had to do, you know, responsive websites. And, you know, I began to see that 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 there were uh, that 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 was possible. And the cool thing about it was for, you know, I mean, I guess I had always thought about. I would love to start a magazine about the South, but starting a magazine in print is a very capital intensive kind of thing. You literally have to buy, you know, ink and paper 
by the freight car load and uh, never had the resources to do that. Uh, but I, I began to see, wow, you could do it on the web. So that was what lured me into it, really. So it was just seeing that possibility. Like, yeah, so like I know, I, like when, I think when you guys started, if I recall correctly, was it like one story? Was it one story a week? Yeah, it was one story a week. Uh, I mean, we really started the thing on a wing, wing and a prayer and got very fortunate uh, because what happened was that uh, we knew we could do one big, you know, well-designed, good-looking, you know, long-form story a week. It's That seemed feasible to us. And it took about, you know, a year to kind of, pull everything together before we launched and you know during that year i had convinced about a half a dozen writer friends of mine to you know write a story that we would be able to publish on this and we probably had about six weeks worth of stories six things in the can when we started and uh you know we we stated our purpose very clearly you know, we, we said very explicit, explicitly and forcefully that we were trying to change Southern stereotypes. Uh, and, and we told people, I mean, I, I literally wrote in, in sort of the opening manifesto for the thing that, you know, if you are a person who still flies the rebel flag in your front yard or you think women look really nice in hoop skirts and we suggest that you find other entertainments on the web we are not for you and people latched on to that and journalists and photographers began coming out of the woodwork and we were able to publish for uh, 52 weeks running before we ever paid a writer or a photographer or di a dime. It was like everybody just wanted to contribute to help get the thing started. Was there anything stylistically like you were looking for in your writers at first, or were you just kind of trying to get like whoever would be willing to sign up? I'd say at 60, the latter and 40, the former, <laughs> uh, you know, of course it was a little more of the latter because I had to take what I could get where I could get it. But, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, a, a solidly middle-aged journalist by that point. And many of my friends were also middle-aged journalists. So they were pretty good at, they, at what they did. They, they, they had good writing chops, you know. And one thing I told people in the beginning is that I wanted them to violate something that all of us had been taught in journalism school when we were young which was to never make yourself a character in the story because I knew if they were going to touch on the issues that the publication should touch on, uh, they would have some emotional involvement in those things. They would, they would be debunking a stereotype that they themselves, they themselves had experienced. So I told them, you know, please don't worry about that old rule write yourself into the piece if you think it's going to make the piece connect with people more strongly. And I think, you know, because we, we, we threw that element of personal essay writing uh, into mostly journalistic stories. Uh, we created a, a good emotional connection with people. Yeah, because I think one of the things that drew me to the uh, to the bitter Southerner, and then of course now Salvation, you know, carrying on to Salvation South was you know the writing because it wasn't just like that kind of pared down you know journalistic style that you. Use. I mean, if you, mm -hmm. I know like because like when you're you're trained to write a specific way for like newspapers and sure. short magazine articles, but like it seems like you guys really kind of just like you uh you know like you were talking earlier like just really just kind of let these people just let them fly. When That's, they when they got on your came to your site, we did very intentionally so, and you know, and I think that's one of the things that allowed us to survive through that first year because writers were figuring out that 
if they had a story idea that they knew no one else would let them do the way they wanted to do the story, we would let them. We were like, come on, bring it. You know, we don't care. We don't have, you know, four open editorial pages to fit it onto. If you need a ridiculous number of words to tell the story, send it to us at a ridiculous length. And if we think it's too long, we'll tell you. You know, and, and I just tried to be a really good editor that got really involved with the writers. And, you know, I tried to help them achieve their visions for, you know, a story that they had always wanted to write. Can I ask, so with all of the people that you've included in your two different projects over the years, um, has anything ever come of that for any of your writers? Have have has you offering them this platform led to any positive results for yourself or for any of your writers? Well, I, you know, you're touching on something that, that is probably the most emotionally rewarding part of this work for me, which is the ability to help in particular younger writers go out and, 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 you know, reach a stage in their career, uh, they had wanted to get into, you know, I mean, I can, uh, you know, I could give you a list of people who, you know, first came to me in the beginning of, of the bitter Southerner, uh, you know, who uh, have since been writing for publications that everyone's heard of the New York times, GQ Esquire, you know, the list goes on. And, uh, you know, I've been really, happy to do that you know we're pretty good I, I i think i'm pretty good at at finding talent and helping it grow right uh mm -hmm. you know there was you know a story i used to tell all the time was like in the first year we were around i was on the board of directors of my old college newspaper at the university of georgia which is independent from the university that's why it has its own board and, uh, you know, I, I was over there at a meeting one day and, and, uh, the, the, a young guy who was, uh, the managing editor at the time, his name was Cy Brown, uh, stopped me on the way out after the meeting. He said, Miss, Mr. Reese, can I talk to you for a second? I've got a story idea that I think would work in the Bitter Southerner. And I was like, and I don't think at the time I had used anything from anyone quite that young, you know, in their early 20s, still in college, that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, he started pitching me the story by telling him, telling me how the previous Christmas his girlfriend had bought him a puppy. And I was like, <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, you know, I've got to love puppies as much as the next person, but you know, I, I didn't know what kind of story it was going to be, but what had happened was that he had, he had become fascinated with trying to find out what breed this dog was or what, you know, it, it at least partly was, uh, because it was, uh, like there's for years been a, a saying in the rural South about, you know, that's his pitiful looking as an old yellow dog and uh you know that it, it, that saying went over into politics you know you, you'd hear this phrase yellow dog democrat you know where, where someone would vote for a democrat even if it was a yellow dog and he had a yellow dog and um he did his research and he came to find out that this was this dog he had was a dog that had just been admitted to as a breed to the kennel club uh, in London and was known as the Carolina dog. And it had been a, a dog species that was traditionally wild in the Pine Barrens of you know the southern United States and in you know Piney Woods wherever and uh uh, 
And so he wrote this story about his, you know, pursuit of trying to establish the bona fides of this dog. And it was called A Carolina Dog. And the day we published it, our traffic went through the roof. I mean, it was a beautifully written, touching story. But it turned out to be like the story started being homework for anybody who thought they had a Carolina dog. <laughs> right. You know, I would, I, I was having to answer questions about that story five years after it was. Popular. I remember that story. The, uh, what they call them like the Dixie Dingoes. Yeah. That was, that was one name for them was Dixie Dingoes. Yeah. Uh, but you know, and, and I'd grown up, you know, my dad would point a dog, a wild dog out to me, you know, look at that old yellow dog. Like it was just, it was a thing and none of us knew where it came from. And, you know, so, you know, unearthing a weird secret of the South, good, always a good trick for a story in my book anyway. So like, I mean, what is so, what are like some other, like, I, I'm trying to think like, what's the, uh, like, you know, I guess like, what is the, uh, the DNA usually, or I guess some of the core tenets of like a good Southern story. Cause y'all have done a lot of them over the years. And sometimes they, they don't always come from like places. Is it, is part of that just like, like you said, just going to these places that you don't really expect. Well, yeah, that's, that's part of it. And, and also I think it's a connection to the land and geography is a thing, you know, the, the Salvation South is a lot more dependent than the Bitter Southerner was on personal essays, you know, and I, we've, and, and on fiction, and, and we've gotten some really beautiful examples of, of both of those. And, and if you guys will indulge me for a second, uh, I want to read you, uh, a couple of brief passages to try to make, to try to answer the question that you just asked me, uh, you know, and, and we'll start with, uh, a story, you know, I, I talked about a, a second ago being wary of, uh, you know, of working with, uh, younger writers back in the beginning. Well, uh, a few months ago, I published an essay by a writer named Ellen Corey, who grew up in Watkinsville, Georgia, and who was, uh, just had finished her freshman year at NYU. And uh, she's 19. And she writes beautifully. And, uh, you know, she wrote this thing about, like, after having moved to New York City, how where she grew up still pulled on her, you know. Uh, and, and like, here's a passage uh, from that piece. My hometown, the one holding the simple pleasures of farm life and football games, will never be my permanent residence again. But the cows welcome me home as if I never left. I resented this plain way of living when it was my constant routine. I could not stand the insular nature. I clawed at the barriers, hoping to run far away. So I did. But when I again immersed myself in this uncomplicated way of living, my eyes flooded with tears. A four-day trip home for Thanksgiving brought more than my grandma's green bean casserole. It brought a reassessment of my life. Fifteen-minute drives with me singing loudly lingered with me much more than they did the summer before I left for school. The simple presence of cattle humbled me into longing for this place I once despised. You know, and, you know, to, to, to get that depth of feeling and, and connection with home, you know, and, and, and Southerners, we get awful serious about home and mama, 
you know, it's like it's a thing that we take to ridiculous extremes. And then, you know, like uh, we ran a, a, a piece of fiction as our lead story not long ago, a short story called Chain Lightning by a guy who's, you know, probably three times as old as Ellen is. Uh, and, you know, like he's got that same connection to the land and it and and this is the uh the first like nine sentences of that article the old man like every old man carried a drought in his eyes he had lived long enough to know that sometimes the rain just quits and he knew doubt grows and fears get loose at 3 a.m he came to expect the ache in his back and trust in his sweat to be a different kind of rain, like there was a storm in him, a kind of dry lightning. He had seen droughts before, but this year seemed different. The ground was harder, so was living. His wife, so sick, smiled once like she was remembering him on one knee, promising to give her everything he would ever have. But here he was doubling up both knees now begging god for time and though god listens time never will that's gorgeous yeah that that's that sounds like damn near poetic especially the way you read it well he's you know i mean i found out the guy who wrote it was a songwriter up in nashville mm -hmm. oh that makes and sense. so you know, when you're when you write songs, you learn economy of language. But you know, it's just beautifully done, and you know it. Uh, and it's just so full of love, and it's expressed in a way that is, you know, obviously influenced by the southern geography that he's a part of. And you know, I think. I think that's what people are loving about Salvation South. It's that, you know, we have created a place for stories that express the love that they have for the place that they live in or, or grew up in. Yeah. Well, I think it's also, uh, and you've mentioned this, you know, in, in before, but you know, like it's uh, one of the things you know, that I like, I think a lot of people admire about it. Like, you know, it, it uh, capturing what uh, Patterson Hood would call the uh, the duality of the Southern thing. <laughs> yeah, still very true. There is a duality of the Southern thing. Because on one hand, you you kind of love a lot of the uh, the culture and the kind of the art and the music, but you also recognize there's some dark stuff behind a lot of it. Uh, yeah, there is. And, and, you know, that's, that's the one thing, you know, that I have never abided in either of my publications is someone who wants to overlook, uh, the ugliness of our history down here. You know, I mean, you have to, uh, you have to acknowledge that stuff. Yeah, you have to, uh, you know, because, you know, it, it's that old South lost cause mythology that has always gotten this region in so much trouble. I mean, see, that that's the thing, you know, Billy Joe, you, you, one thing you have to understand if you didn't grow up down here is that after the Civil War ended, an organization called the United Daughters of the Confederacy began to tell a completely different version of the history of the Civil War. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that these were noble, gallant people, you know, living in splendor and that the slaves were treated well. And, you know, it literally was a giant pack of lies. But it actually got written into the history books that I went to school on. 
I feel like this is one maybe, of those... Maybe Brandon might be young enough to have I, I think escaped that a little bit. It I don't might know. have been kind of petering out right about the time I was getting in school, but I, it's like, yeah. I definitely know, like, definitely some of the older people that I... I I knew and kind of like you could definitely tell there was kind of an attitude. Like they kind of had those rose colored glasses on when they looked back. And I, think Oh yeah. It's, and it's, and it's, it's one of those things that I think it's, it's one of those instances of like using your powers for good or using them for evil. Cause like, it's one like the, the storytelling aspect of Southern culture. And you had this right. one group that took that and then just twisted it to try and create this false narrative. But it was, to a lot of people, I, I almost feel like it's this, this form of like conservative white guilt where the, you know, you've got the, mm. the kind of the liberal white guilt where it's just kind of endlessly self-flagellating, but then you've got the conservative white guilt was like, we just don't want to talk about it or, it's, or no, 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 it wasn't that bad. Or it wasn't me. It was. It was. Yeah. It wasn't me. It yeah, wasn't or me. What, yeah. It wasn't right. me. That was, that was some other people. There's not, no, that wasn't us. That wasn't us. Right. I'm not racist. They were, but right. I'm not. Like, I'm not racist, you know. but I can show you a real racist over there. Or, you know? Like, that right. wasn't me. That was a different time. My my parents and grandma, everyone was raised differently back then, et cetera. You know, but, and, and, and the interesting thing is there's a little bit of truth in that, but just only a little bit. Yes, you know, that might have been a couple of generations ago in your family. But, you know, you have to acknowledge it was there. You can't just say, well, because those people are, are dead now that evil wasn't done and that it doesn't persist in different form today, you know, and that's, you know, the people who will redeem the South over time are the people who are learning how not to think like that. The people who are willing to step up and acknowledge, you know, uh, the wrong that was done and not just to acknowledge the wrong that was done, but to actually try to put yourself in the shoes of people who suffered as a result of that, you know, but wouldn't you that, say that's, that's like, the that's, hard that's, part. That's also like, but that that's, I feel like that's something that's kind of fundamental to you, to, you know, all the stuff you've done, like with both websites, especially South Bay and South really kind of digging into it is that kind of, you know, does like good, really good writing a lot of times comes from just kind of being brutally self honest. Yeah. Yeah. We, we try to do that, you know, and, you know, we're, we're becoming a, a place where, you know, all different kinds of people can display those same qualities, right? You know, like we, this week we had a, a really poetry heavy week and there's a, uh, we ran a package of, of, of three pieces uh, by a, a poet who's based in D.C. named Brian Gilmore, who's a much lauded, you know, widely published poet. And he gave us uh, two pieces of prose, one an essay and the other in the form of a letter to his grandmother plus a poem. And the three of them together kind of chronicle the, the journey of his family's life from working as sharecroppers in South Carolina, you know, after the Civil War to moving to, to Washington, D.C. And, and living in a neighborhood there called Brookwood that was in the early 20th century, really a heyday of, you know, black achievement and intellectualism. And, uh, you know, it was just a beautiful package of things, you know, and the thing that, that, that he was reckoning with in the letter to his grandmother was the fact that his grandmother who had grown up there in South Carolina, uh, she had a bunch of old Confederate currency, Confederate money that she kept pinned to the wall in her house. And it never really made a lot of sense to him why she did that. But then he, you know, as he got older, he learned that that was something she kept there to remind her of what she had worked so hard to get away from, you know, and, and how she didn't want anyone in her family to have to go back to that, you know, and that's, 
you know, I like the fact that we're a place where, uh, you know, any kind of story that reckons with, you know, the wreckage that was left behind, you know, by that era and, and what came after it, you know, and sadly it hasn't all gone away. In fact, a lot of it seems to be coming back in different form now, you know, so, uh, if I'm going to keep beating this drum, I don't think I'm ever going to be out of a job, sadly. You know, but. Yeah, I, so I wanted to ask you, because I know we're, we're coming up on an hour, but I kind of wanted to ask you, we talked a little bit before about, you know, your, your background in music and wanting to be a music journalist and talked about the history of music. Um, between music and, say, other Southern writers, what are your influences? Or your, biggest, your biggest influences? Like uh, what, you know, if you have to pick I, I can just feel Chuck, yeah. just, just, he's like, <laughs> That's like okay. That's a hard question. That's a hard question. Uh, off the top of your head. We won't, I know. Off I, the, off, <laughs> well, off the, uh, off the top of my head, musically, the, the, the things that have always seemed most significant to me, uh, is the soul music of the early 1960s and mid 60s mm. that came specifically out of Memphis and out of Muscle Shoals, Alabama. Okay. Because, you know, uh, the best story you tell about that is the story of Booker T and the MGs. Okay. Billy Joe, have you ever heard of a record label called Stax? S T A X? Mm. Yeah. Okay. Stax Records was, you know, put out so many soul hits. Otis Redding was on Stax, Wilson Pickett, the list goes on and on. And uh, the house band who played behind almost every singer who recorded on Stax was called Booker T and the MGs. And it was uh, two white guys, Steve Cropper and Dennis Duck Dunn, and two black guys, Booker T. Jones and Al Jackson, who was the drummer. Uh, and they were young kids who loved playing music together. They loved, you know, and they were making up music that the world still dances to. And they could do all this amazing stuff in the studio. But when they would walk outside... They couldn't go have lunch together, you know, because of the Jim Crow laws. And, you know, I think the, the music that got made then exemplified a spirit in forward-looking Southerners. That's just like you can't delve deeply enough into that stuff. And the beautiful part is it all just rocks. It's such amazing music, you know, and the same was true happening over in Muscle Shoals, Alabama. And so that's always a big thing with me. And and then, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm fairly, uh, you know, I, I, I think probably the three most important Southern writers to me are, are William Faulkner and Flannery O'Connor and Zora Neale Hurston. Now, I, I got taught. O'Connor and Faulkner when I was in college. It took me a while longer to come to know the work of Zora Neale Hurston, you know, who was both an anthropologist and uh, a novelist and an essayist. Like she wrote a very famous essay back in the 1930s called What It Feels Like to Be Colored Me. And, you know, it was something that she wrote after she had moved from her native Florida up to uh, New York City. You know, it's a beautiful piece of writing. And Faulkner was always, you know, willing and eager to, to dig into the complexity of, of, you know, the South's history, you know. And he can be a damned hard to read sometimes. But once you figure out that Faulkner is just writing... Like, I, I don't know about you, but I have voices in my head. I, most people do, even if they won't admit it. And uh, if you're a you writer, that's out, just, but, it, you know, people usually, you just tell them, oh, I'm just a writer. It's 
Faulkner could transcribe the voices in his head, and that's why it's so hard to read him. You know, and then Flannery O'Connor, who had this sort of twisted, deeply religiously influenced, you know, look at the characters that she created and, you know, was so good at writing about the misfits, that, you know, or just uniquely Southern. Uh, you know, those, those I, I would say, are probably my three biggest, you know, literary influences. And then there are journalists who are big influence influences on me uh, you know in particular i would say hunter s thompson and tom wolf who are both southern any contemporary authors from the south that you're oh god yeah, there's so much stuff going on now that's there are, there's a lot of horror novels coming out of the south right now that's what there I'm... are there are uh my uh, jasmine ward who was a National Book Award winning novelist from Mississippi is amazing. She's absolutely critical. If you want to read modern Southern fiction, she has to be a part of what you do these days. Uh, I'm a, a big fan of uh, a couple of, of, of writers who work in, in what some folks refer to as Southern noir. Or rural uh, noir, I've heard that term. Rural as well. noir, right? Uh, Michael Ferris Smith, uh, who lives in Oxford, Mississippi, and uh, uh, is from South Mississippi, and then David Joy, who uh, you know, and, and I, I have the distinct pleasure of knowing both of these guys. And David lives in in Western North Carolina, and and writes about the people of Ach Appalachia more accurately than than any anyone else going right now i think uh, in, in david's most recent book uh is a, a story very much about racial reckoning and it's called uh uh those we thought we knew and it's child-droppingly good it's an amazing book uh I'm also a big fan of Daniel Wallace, uh, who's a writer from Alabama, but lives in North Carolina, uh, who uh, is mostly known for his fiction. Uh, the thing by him most people know is Big Fish, which got made into a movie with Albert Finney and Ewan McGregor. You love that movie? I don't love the movie. I love the book. The book oh, you love the book? Uh, the I read I read the book when my grandfather w was in hospice. Oh and man. That oh. and it's such a short book. It is. And it is so touching. And it it's yeah, it's it's a beautiful, heartbreaking, amazing, whimsical, delightful book. And it, um the movie didn't quite do it justice. No, no, it didn't. It didn't. But it, w it was a good movie. I'll give it that. It wasn't like yeah. you, you saw the movie and went. <laughs> oh, no, it God. wasn't bad. Yeah. It wasn't yeah. bad. It just didn't. I mean, it didn't capture the well, magic. You can't, Wait. Well, you, no, you can't capture the, the depth of a story mm. uh, about the older and younger Bloom, you know. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's a bit, but, his, you know, his most recent thing uh, is uh, his first work of nonfiction. Uh, and it's called This Isn't Going to End Well. And uh, it's basically the story of his brother-in-law, who was a guy named William Neely, who got very famous among the outdoor, like, mountain biking, paddling crowd, you know, in the late 20th century. Uh uh, Neely essentially mapped and wrote guidebooks about every whitewater river in the South. Uh, his maps, if you go to like outdoor centers and hiking places, you know, any kind of outfitter store, you're still going to find his work for sale there. That was Daniel's brother-in-law, and, and William was the kind of guy who was like, he could fix everything. Everyone loved him. He was always like on top of his game and full of life. And then about 20 years ago, he he uh, 
went out to a marina where he kept his boat and he shot himself in the head. Mm. And wow. uh, after Daniel's sister, who William had taken, you know, uh, William's wife, uh, you know, she had fought for her whole life with a variety of autoimmune diseases. And she died, I don't know, seven or eight years after William killed himself. And when they were cleaning out her house, Daniel found several boxes that were full of William's journals. And for two or three years, he didn't read them. And he finally cracked them open and discovered that uh, the William that he and all of the other people in his life had come to love was uh, basically just a character. Mm -hmm. uh, William had had suicidal ideations every day of his life and that, you know, he, he suffered really dark depression and just essentially created a whole other personality. So he didn't have to expose that to anyone else in the world. And this book is just jaw droppingly good. And we were really fortunate uh, when the book was about to come out back in April, uh, Daniel allowed us to uh, excerpt a chapter from it, and he wrote an essay exclusively for us about the process of, of writing that book and how he deciphered William's journals. And, uh, you know, I, I, I can't recommend Daniel's work highly enough. He's wonderful. And, you know, another writer I, I dig a lot right now is Ann Patchett, uh, mm. who doesn't, you know, work entire, doesn't set all her novels in the South or anything like that. You can read a lot of her stuff, including her Pulitzer Prize winner, The Dutch House, you know, which doesn't have a single solitary thing to do with the South. But she's she's Nashvilleian, and uh, she owns a great bookstore in Nashville called Parnassus, and you know, she's always worth reading. The ease with which she writes dialogue stuns me. She actually, my mom has never been a reader because my mom has a, a, it's not exactly, it's not dyslexia, but it's something similar. Like she has a disability with her eyes that causes her to not be able to read well. Oh, really? She's, yeah. So she has a master's degree, but she, and she's a teacher, but she's not, she doesn't enjoy reading. Well, all of a sudden she's reading and she's like, oh, Ann Patchett, so amazing. I was like, you're reading now? But Ann Patchett apparently is what got her to read. So, wow. Yeah. Has she read The Dutch House yet? I don't remember which ones she's read. I think her sisters and her all were kind of sharing books. So okay. That that, that that book is amazing. I, I And I'm, I'm kind of full up with it because I only finished it about a month ago it won the pulitzer prize for literature in uh 2020 mm. <laughs> and the book is so big that uh uh the person who reads the audiobook version of it is tom hanks <laughs> <laughs> that's the kind of clout and patch it has these days so amazing yeah yeah well, I mean, we could I, like I, I, we could probably sit here and just do this like all the rest of the day, but uh, we want to be respectful of your time. Uh, and before we, well, I mean, I you know, I, I I don't mind you know keep me out of work for a while. I can just call it a day. <laughs> uh, so, like, where can the people find you online if they want to at you? SalvationSouth.com. dot com, and uh, they can also. Uh, get on their favorite podcast app and search for Salvation South. Uh, because uh, for the last year and a half, I've been doing uh, three minute commentaries that run every Friday during morning edition and all things considered on the Georgia public broadcasting network all over the state. And uh, very soon, I think, uh, there will be some longer form audio storytelling done on there, which we're going to refer to as Salvation South Deluxe. Okay. So, 
And I, I'm just saying, fun. I've seen how I listen. I follow the uh, the Salvation South podcast. You can pack a lot a lot into those three minutes. I was thinking the uh, the Zora Neale Hurston story. I listened to that recently. I was impressed by how how much you got in that little time frame. The one that ran last Friday was about the history of of the song "We Shall Overcome," mm. and uh, I got so frustrated trying to pack that into three minutes. Like I, I literally was like, I wish I was writing this on a typewriter so I could yank it out of the typewriter and set it on fire. I had such <laughs> trouble with that. Uh, but, you know, so the three minute thing is tough sometimes, but I enjoy doing those. They're, they're a lot of fun. I think and, being succinct, succinct is the hardest thing in the world. It's that it's that quip of if I'd had more time, I would have written you a shorter letter. Like I always feel that. <laughs> I can't remember who said that, but that's so accurate. I feel it so hard every time I'm writing. I like write a blog post and I have to go back and like cut it down by like a quarter. I mean, I mean, like, like cut it down to a quarter of what I wrote. <laughs> I also feel yeah. like it's it's like a southern thing too. Like you, it's like a, it's we tend to be a little more verbose. I think one of the the back when I was tweeting a lot, one of the the most liked things I had, I think, and it was and because it, it was probably like in connection to like a a thing you guys did back in the day on the bitter southerner, like it was right about the time, and this was before Twitter expanded. I said, yeah, yeah. if a southerner had invented Twitter, it wouldn't have been 140 characters. It would have been at least 400. <laughs> This is right. before it. This is like like a couple of years before it expanded. I think somebody heard me because it would have been 140 words, is what I think. Yeah, <laughs> it wouldn't have been I mean, yeah, 140 characters. It'd be like yeah, it'd, it'd be at yeah. least you know it, you'd be posting a lot longer things if it had been Southerners that had created it. You can, I, you it know. Up. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. I was just gonna say we ought to create something like that. Hey, venture capitalists, long-winded social media is coming your way. Just Call me and Billy Joe and Brandon and we'll figure it out. Wait long enough, the Twitter name will be free again. So, I mean. (laughs) Don't get me started on Elon. (laughs) Yeah, that's that. that This this will all take a a turn for the for the for the worst if we go there. That's right. That's right. Yeah, he's got he's got enough attention. He he doesn't need any more. That's right. This is true. 18 children. Yes. Jesus. (laughs) Okay. All right. <laughs> like, and he's giving them names like Transformers, like Techno Animus or Xenium. Yeah, I know. I know. I read those names. I can't remember what they, they were because I was just like, all I could think, all of those kids have the same name and their name is Poor Kid. Oh, yeah. oh God. <laughs> I, I, I mean, it's, it's like, no, it's funny because there's one of the, like, it's about like a Southern story uh, before we, before we jump off. There's this, there's a, okay. So there's this, the, this name, it's like spelled L E dash a, how do you think you pronounce that? L E dash a. Yes. How would you, how would you, if you're reading that? Leah. Leah. No, the name was Ladasha. And it was apparently it was a girl in new Orleans. Who's Ladasha was supposed to eat. Okay. And, and when they asked her about it, I think her response was because the dash don't be silent. The dash don't be silent. And you know what? Up until Elon started having his first kid with whatever that like mathematics, <laughs> I was like, that was Ladasha would have been the worst name. And then Elon comes along and his first kid. And I was like, okay, I think we have a new winner. Okay, well, what if, that, I, what if I had a, an asterisk and then uh, just an asterisk with an A and an asterisk? Like, we'll just go with that. Hey, there, that's that's creative. Ooh, I like it. I want to name a child in Terabang. <laughs> I like the symbol, because I well, like the I, symbol. I, I tell you what, I, that that reminds me of of one of my buddies from my childhood named L. H. Sales, and he didn't have any. His name was just L. H. L. was his first name, and H. was his middle name. No period, because it wasn't an abbreviation for anything. And his father was L.H. He was L.H. Sales Jr. His father was L.H. Sales Sr. And and the elder L.H. was uh, was named that because his parents wanted to name him after both of his grandfathers, which who were named Luther 
and Haggai, H-A-G-G-A-I, like the book in the Old Testament. Uh, but it was pronounced in the mountains, Haji. So they didn't want him to have to bear the name of Luther Haji Sales. So he was just L-H. But we used to, you know, like I heard a, a comedian, a uh, guy named Henry Cho, who was full-blooded Korean but grew up in Knoxville, Tennessee. And this was 20, 25 years ago. And he, 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 he told a story about his friend that he grew up with named J.B. Stewart, who had the same situation, didn't stand for anything. And when J.B. got old enough to go get his driver's license, he filled out the application J, parentheses only, B, parentheses only, Stewart. And he got his driver's license back in the mail, and it said, Jonely Bonely Stewart. And <laughs> I've heard that uh, story. Oh my God. And, and so we used to say to LH, you know, does your driver's license say lonely, homely sales? But... <laughs> oh, my God. Oh. That's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds they're, me, they're, I, know, I know a guy whose name is Mark, M-A-R-C, and he went to Starbucks one time and says, like, he says it's Mark with a C. And so when he got his cup back, it was C-A-R-K. Kark. <laughs> <laughs> Mark with a C, yeah. Mm. Okay, well, well <laughs> Chuck, thanks for coming out, man. Uh, it's uh, it's always a good, always good talking to you. It's we could do this Good all talking day. to you too, Brandon and, and Billy Joe. I hope we get a chance to hang out sometimes because anybody who's got a picture of Bob Ross in their office is fine with me. It's my post-it notes. It's a, it's, it's a pretty little post-it note. It's post-it notes. Nice. <laughs> I love Bob Ross. I you love can't him. not love Bob Ross. Bob, you know, watching Bob Ross is like listening to a sweet lullaby. It's 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 a little hug before you go to sleep, especially if you get to see a squirrel. You know, I mean, it's... we're gonna put a pretty little squirrel in there now. Pretty... <laughs> well, he had a pet squirrel <laughs> for a while, so it's in some episodes. I mean, oh, I know. Um, it's the, uh... the Calm app has literally just taken the audio from his episodes <laughs> and just put them up on the app. I am not kidding. Has like, it really? Yes, there's seriously. If you if you get the Calm app and you and you pay for it, it's I'm a Headspace guy, so I don't know this. It's yeah, but it's like there's literally wow. like a section. It's just all the joy of painting, and it's just the episodes. It's just the audio. Well, my roommate and I started that a long time ago, like five years, six years ago. We used to like watch some horror movie, and then before bed, we would just have our what we called our palate cleanser, and we would watch an episode of Bob Ross, and then we could go to bed without having nightmares. It was great. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. So, are have we? Is all of this stuff that we've just been doing, is that going to be part of the show too? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so. it's, it's all, it's all. Hey, fun. that's, that's <laughs> wonderful. That's wonderful. That will be all for this episode. To keep up with the show, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Scratch Claw Push. If social media isn't your thing, you can contact us at scratchclawpush at gmail.com. This podcast has been a Carcutta Media production. For a full list of our podcasts, go to carcuttamedia.com slash podcasts. This recording or any portion thereof may not be reproduced or used in any manner whatsoever without the express written permission of the publisher, except for use of brief quotations and review. Copyright 2023 by Carcutta Media, LLC. All rights reserved. Thank you.